Thank you very much, Alec. It's wonderful to be back here. Before I say anything more, may I first just express a word of thanks which the Anglophones must always express, which is for you to allow me to come here and speak to you in my own language. This is an enormous privilege. Thank you very much. Okay, this being the introductory lecture in our conference, I abandoned my PowerPoint presentation, which was rather detailed, and decided that I would like to offer something completely introductory. Um, we're here at our conference to talk about the Republican tradition in European political speculation. That's to say about the ideals and the institutions which are distinctive of republics and about their histories. So I just want to try this evening to start by offering something completely general and introductory about how republicanism fits into a wider story. It's a map that I'm going to try to offer you. And I'm going to try to place the republican tradition on a map of wider speculations about the ideals of constitutionalism. Now, um, in order to see where, you, where republicanism fits, I, I think you have to recognize one crucial feature about the republican tradition um, generally, which is that this is a tradition which thinks that the most important value in our common life is freedom. Now, that needn't be the case. The contemporary uh, liberal presupposition is that the most important value is justice, whereas, of course, for the Republican, there would have to be a Republican ideal of justice. Um, utilitarians would tell you that the most important value is the common good. Various Marxist strands of thought would tell you that the fundamental ideal is enabling people to follow real interests. The Republican is the person who says that the fundamental value is, or Eich already said it, is freedom. And what it is to be able to live freely in a civil association. So the fundamental value is freedom, and what you have to understand to understand republicanism is its view of freedom. All right, now comes the map, because the republican story fits onto a very complex conceptual history that one can offer in Western European, in particular, speculation about the concept of political liberty. And that's what I'm going to try to do in the first half of this lecture, is to talk about um, where republicanism would fit on a very general map of more mainstream ways of thinking about the idea of political liberty. So is that okay? So here, this is, this is the map. And in order for you to see where republicanism fits, um, I'm going to have to talk about not republicanism, um, so that you'll see how it fits in relation to other concepts. So let's think um, about the, the, what would be the Western European mainstream way of thinking about political liberty, is the one. Well, the answer is yes. Uh, and if you think of the German tradition of the 17th century in public law, or if you think of the Anglophone tradition of the same period, you'll, you'll come up with, with major names like Pufendorf in the German tradition, or even more important, because he's so crucial for Pufendorf, uh, I'm sorry to say it's the name of an Englishman, but the name of Thomas Hobbes. So far as I'm aware, certainly in the Anglophone tradition, the earliest modern political philosopher who gives or tries to give an absolutely abstract and inclusive analysis of how you should think about the concept of political liberty is Hobbes. So what is his story? It's an incredibly influential story. And in fact, you already know it. It's very familiar to you. And it's also quite simple. So let me just lay it out. What freedom is, according to this founding moment in the Western liberal tradition, is just two things. There has to be power on the part of an agent to, to do something. That's to say, to follow an action which is an option, an alternative. I can do this, I can do that. Freedom is having the power to make that choice. And secondly, freedom involves that there be no interference with your exercise of that power. So there it is. It's very simple. But of course it's much too simple 
because what you need to understand, surely, if you're going to understand freedom, it now turns out is, what is this idea of interference? If freedom is absence of interference, what is interference? Right, that's not a simple notion. Um, the Hobbesian strand of the liberal tradition, which is still alive and with us, gives a very restricted answer. It says, interference is when there is a physical act of prevention of you as the agent from exercising your powers. You're physically compelled to act against your will, or you're physically made to act in a certain way. So it's either prevention or compulsion, but it has to be physical, such that your power, your underlying power to act, is taken away. It's impossible for you to act except in a certain way. So freedom is contrasted with impossibility. So there's the Hobbesian analysis. Now, that analysis contains what you might think a very counterintuitive implication and of course the development of liberalism is the exploration of what's counterintuitive about it. So what is counterintuitive about it? It is surely the idea um, that if I coerce your will, so for example I threaten you with very serious consequences if you don't do what I do, then on this analysis, because th threatening your will doesn't make it impossible for you to exercise your power, when you act according to my will, when I bend your will, nevertheless I act freely. I'm completely free. That's the strange implication. And 17th century philosophers, they really meant this and they always give an example, which is quite common at the time, which is the highwayman. You know, the highwayman is the person who stops your coach and says, your money or your life. Hobbes says, you're being offered a choice. And that's what you've got to admit. You're being offered money, life, go on. Now, now choose. That's freedom. Freedom is having the choice. It's not impossible to give him your life. And Hobbes has an unpleasant joke. He says, when you give him your money instead of your life, you do it willingly. In fact, he says, you do it very willingly. So how can you say that wasn't a free action? So that's what free action is. It's having an alternative. It hasn't been stopped. Now, that's too restricted. And as I said, you could construct the liberal tradition as saying, well, something's gone wrong there. And in the Anglophone tradition, which I'll speak about for a moment, uh, what's thought wrong is, is this figure of the, 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 the person who, who puts you under illegal threat. So if you consider, just for a moment in the Anglophone tradition, the next really major work on constitutional and freedom in our tradition, John Locke's Two Treatises of Government, then uh, I quote paragraph 176 of the second treatise, a robber breaks into my house and with a dagger at my throat makes me seal a deed to convey my uh, property to him. Does that give him a just title? So the question is purely rhetorical. Locke's saying, of course it doesn't. He does not act freely. Now, it's true it's not impossible for him to seal these deeds. He could do it, and Hobbes would be saying, yeah, of course, he's doing it very freely. Locke wants to say, no, something's gone wrong there. And what we need uh, uh, to make central to our discussions of freedom is the idea of coercion. You're free if an action within your powers is prevented from being performed. He doesn't deny that, of course. I mean, if I stop you physically, but you must say that coercion of the will takes away freedom. Now, if you do say those two things, that is the modern Western European, Anglophone included, tradition of way of thinking about freedom. Just to stick with the Anglophone case for a moment, um, the most famous treatise on how to think about political liberty in, in modern times, written in English, has been Isaiah Berlin. Of course, he's Russian, really. But um, Isaiah Berlin's treatise called Two Concepts of Liberty, long, famous essay. And if he has a preferred concept, there are two concepts, and he has a preferred concept. What is that concept? The answer is exactly the one I've now laid out. That's liberty. It is non-interference with your powers, 
where that either means prevention or coercion. That's liberty. Now that view in the Anglophone tradition, as I've said, is, is a 17th century philosophical discussion, but of course it becomes extremely important in the Enlightenment, especially with Enlightenment utilitarianism. Um, and that whole tradition runs through um, in, in utilitarian philosophy until the present day. However, if you think about 19th century political philosophy, this liberal story got complicated in two ways that I now want to talk about. So here's the map. Now you've got the liberal tradition. Two strands of it in the Anglophone tradition, the Hobbesian, Pufendorfian one, or the Lockean, Hume uh, story. Um, now in 19th century social philosophy, that's, as I say, subjected to criticism in two very important ways. I now need to say a word about them. First, the late Enlightenment attack that's associated with the philosophy of Kant, but particularly Hegel's political philosophy, particularly the philosophy of right, which is an attack on Anglophone Enlightenment liberalism. Uh, and, and, and Hegel says, you remember, uh, in book one of the philosophy of right, only the English could be so crude as to suppose that that's what freedom is. They, they've missed something tremendously important. So what have they missed? They think freedom is a negative concept. That's to say you're free just in the absence of interference. So negative, no interference, that's freedom. So it's seen as a negative concept. Hegel wants to say, and that's what um, book three of the philosophy of right picks up the role of the state in this is, you're not free unless you use this absence of interference in certain ways. So what the Anglophone tradition, according to Hegel, does is it only picks up the negative moment in the dialectic of freedom. There's a dialectic of freedom and that consists in answering the question, what do you want this absence of interference for? Why do you want it? Why is freedom a value? There's the positive moment in the dialectic, is having an answer to that question. And as you know, the Hegelian answer brings us to the theory of the state, which is that you want that freedom, but not at all for the reasons that liberal political theory tells you. Now, liberal political theory, you might think this is its glory, says, well, you want this freedom for whatever, whatever reasons you want it for. I mean, that's, you can't foreclose on those reasons. Freedom is being able to do what you want. But the Hegelian says, no, no, no. It's being able to do what is a realization of your most distinctively human qualities. That is the free person. And so in the wake of that argument of Hegel's, which became incredibly influential in 19th century social philosophy, you get a huge extra premise added to liberalism. And the extra premise is human nature is normative. The liberal idea is, you know, we just all have these passions, we go our way, that's freedom. The normative claim about human nature is there are certain purposes which are distinctively human. And freedom is pursuing those purposes. So on this account, the liberal says, in order for me to know if you're free, I just need to know what opportunities you have, what alternatives, what options. You show me that you've got options, you can leave the room, you can stay, that's freedom. The Hegelian says, no, 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 you'll only know how, if this person is free once you see how they behave. Freedom is a pattern of behaviour. So what pattern of behaviour? Well, in the Western tradition, thinking very globally, there have been different answers to that. And as you can see, once you say human nature is normative, there are certain ends which are distinctively human, then there are going to be as many theories of positive liberty as there are coherent answers to the question, what are human purposes? But, of course, the main answer that's been given in our tradition is the one that takes you right back, as it took Hegel right back, to Aristotle the zoon politicon. What's characteristic of mankind is that we are the political animal, the zoon politicon. And the fullest realization of your powers 
and therefore your greatest freedom, depends upon your taking part in a civil association. So if I see the pattern of your behaviour, and I see that that's how you conduct yourself, then I say you're free. Now that's a view of freedom which has been much revived in our time. I suppose the most famous um, philosopher who took up exactly that view of freedom is Hannah Arendt uh, in her book Between Past and Future, the essays on freedom uh, and also in the human condition where she goes back quite explicitly, although it's mediated by Heidegger, it's an Aristotelian story about how the, the range of skills and the character of the virtues which are needed to sustain a public life uh, are what are your most fundamental purposes. That's what makes you most fully you. And if you follow those purposes, you are a free person. You're a free, that is freedom. So when she ans asks the question in the famous essay called, what is freedom? She answers, freedom is politics. No, freedom is politics, okay? That, I mean, if you engage in the public life of your community, you're free. If you don't, you're not. So it's absolutely the opposite of the liberal. If you want a, 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 another contemporary political philosopher who takes exactly that view, Charles Taylor, in his um, great work, Sources of the Self, the, the, the true self, which is what he's looking for, is the self who commits themselves to the public arena, and that's the free person. Now, that is one way of criticising liberalism, which became very important in the 19th century. But there's a second way, which becomes much more mainstream, and is an internal development of liberalism, and I want now to move on to that. Now, as we saw, the liberal is the person, was and is. The liberal, if you, I mean, you think of contemporary liberal political theory, is the person who says, if you want freedom defined in a sentence, it's absence of interference by any external agent who takes away a power of yours, either by coercion or prevention. <coughs> so, but then there comes a moment in the history of liberalism in the 19th century. I mean, Herzen is very important here in the Russian tradition. Um, Tocqueville in the French tradition, John Stuart Mill, for whom both Hudson and, uh, I mean especially Tocqueville, are, are important uh, in the Anglophone tradition. And that raises this question. It says, all right, we agree that freedom is negative, it's absence of interference, but why does that interference have to be by external agencies, other, I mean, organisations, people, states, why does it have to be external? Don't we have to make sense of the claim that the agent who can undermine your own freedom might be you? Not an external agent at all. Don't we have to make sense of the idea that you could be the agent who limits your own freedom? Well, it's a, a wonderful idea, and the question is, well, how could that be so? How could you be the agent of your own freedom? Well, much 19th century philosophy interested in the category of the social tries to answer that question. Of course there's, a, there's an ancient answer here which is very much picked up in 17th century philosophy where this is anticipated which says we want a distinction between reason and the passions. This goes back as far as Plato's Timaeus where the will you remember in that geography of the mind can ally itself either with the passions in which case the resulting action is not free or it can ally itself with reason, in which case the resulting action is free. So that generates a distinction very important in 17th century philosophy, for example, central to a text like John Locke's an essay on human understanding, a distinction between liberty and license. If you act out of the passions, you do not act freely, your action is licentious but not free. So that distinction, which of course notice Hobbes abolishes, he thinks, well that's ridiculous. In that case all actions are licentious. So there's a big debate there, but here is a tradition which says there's one way in which you can make yourself unfree. You can be, and, and this was the phrase always used, and notice how resonant it is for a theory of freedom, being a slave to your passions. 
the notion of addiction here. So there's one answer. That's certainly not the answer that interests Mill. The answer is that, that interests Mill, and, and of course Tocqueville before Mill, is that you could live in a society, as they both thought they were doing in 19th century France or England, in which the mœurs, as, as Tocqueville calls them, or the, the mores of the society are so strong in relation, for example, to personal codes of conduct, sexual mores, dress codes, all of these sorts of things, they're so strong that you are unable authentically to pursue your own desires, as freedom requires, you make these mores into your second nature and they become your first nature. That's Mill's phrase. So what has happened from the perspective of freedom is you have inauthentically internalized these mores. You've made yourself out of them. So you're limiting your own freedom because various alternatives don't occur to you. If we were going to say a final word about the way in which the liberal story about freedom was undermined in the 19th century, surely we'd also want to mention the name of Freud. Think of Freud, as he liked to do, as a writer on liberty. He wants, to, he wants you to liberate yourself. Well, from what? Well, from yourself, of course. He completely agrees with this. And Freud's great discovery was the entity, the unconscious, which contains these motives of which you're not fully aware, which generate neurotic and obsessional behavior. But the, the, the therapy makes you aware of them, and it's an act of liberation. So what has happened? The self has liberated the self from the self. So there is another way of thinking about freedom. Now, if you put that addition, uh, put all those additions together, I think you would have a map of how, in Western political speculation since the 17th century, those are the ways that freedom has been thought about. Now, the Republican. The Republican is the person who says, all of that's wrong. The, you, I hope you haven't been taking notes, because it's all wrong. N n n freedom isn't anything to do with any of that. So it's an extraordinarily dramatic intervention in the tradition. That's the, what, the point I've been trying to bring out. Think of that, and think of all the names I've fitted onto that story. And here is this tradition which says, I'm sorry, that's, you just haven't understood freedom at all. It's something else. And if you look at some contemporary philosophers who wanted to revive republican ideals of freedom, there's, I shan't say a paranoid moment, but if you look at the unbelievably important writings of Philip Pettit on the theory of republicanism, you, you will see that he regards it as a kind of ideological move of, of Western societies that, that wish to disavow a republican way of thinking about freedom because it just looked too demanding, too difficult. So people thought, well, let's not think about it that way. Let's think about it in the ways that I've laid out. So what does the Republican say? The Republican says, where you've all got off on the wrong foot, liberals, Hegelians, is that you think that freedom is to do with actions. But it's not. Freedom is the name of a status. And the question is, what makes you, and here the classical tradition wells up, what makes you a liber homo? Now, homo in the Latin language, of course, means man or woman. So the question is, what makes you a free man or woman? That's the question you should be asking yourself. Not, can I do this or can I do that? But, am I a free person? That's the question you should ask. So what is it to be a free person? That's the question. And that's the question which has, as I said, a classical answer. Interestingly, however, especially because in classical philosophy there's a tremendous snobbery about how the Greeks invented everything and then the Romans took it over, this is not a feature of Greek philosophy. Eleutheria, freedom, well, it's there in Greek philosophy, but, but that's not the key notion. Dikaiosony, there's the, free, the crucial notion. We want to talk about justice. Peridikaion, Plato's great title, concerning justice. But the Roman tradition wants to say, no, no, libertas concerning freedom. That's what we should be asking about. And if you think of the Roman tradition for a moment, there are two really vital groupings here. First is the great Roman historians, 
And here you'd want to mention Livy and Tacitus. If you know Livy's history, you will know that the hinge between book one and book two, a moment of great drama in antiquity, he wanted to say, is the move in Rome from the rule of the Tarquins as kings to the rule of the consuls. And this was a move, he says, because the consuls are elected and for a short time, this is a move from servitude to freedom. And that's how the Latin comes up. They, they were servi, the, the, the whole population was servi, they were slaves, and they became liberi homines, they became free men and women. And that's just the move from the kingship to the republic. Or Tacitus. Tacitus' annals about the loss of the Republic and the rise of the Principate. Again, he says, the whole political class lost its standing as liberi homines because of the Principate and we became servi once again. So notice the crucial distinction here, which is going to tell you what freedom really is, is what does it mean to be a slave? Okay, that's the distinction. You're a liber homo or you're a servus. Now, obviously, if you're a service, you're not free. I mean, a, a slave is not free, that's sort of definitionally true. But to understand freedom, what you need to understand, according to this classical tradition, is what does it mean to be a slave? What, what does it mean to be a slave? Don't answer to be coerced in relation to your powers. I mean, that's the liberal answer. Well, that's a very unsatisfactory answer, you'd have to say. Because suppose a slave who um, had a completely benign master or whose master um, was absent, um, who was able to do exactly what he wanted. This figure is a recurrent figure in Roman comedy. This is a slave who only ever does what he or she wants. They're never coerced. So in a liberal understanding of freedom, you're left with a horrible paradox, which is the free slave. And liberal thinkers have wrestled with this, I mean, Berlin wrestles with it. But you're left with the idea, well, there could be a free slave. Well, the thing to say about that, my friends, is you've lost your grip on the concept. You're not saying anything interesting. If slaves are free, we're lost. Slaves are unfree. The question is, what makes them unfree? Well, nothing to do with coercion. What makes a slave, makes you unfree, loses you your status as a liber homo, is if you are subject to the arbitrary power of someone else. That power doesn't have to be exercised. The slave is someone who is subject to someone's arbitrary will. Notice in the Latin arbitrium, we would say arbitrary in English, but arbitrium in Latin just means the will. You're completely subject to somebody else's will. That may be all right, nothing bad may happen, but you're subject to their will. That is slavery. And there's the distinction between the liber homo. The second classical text one would have to mention here is the Roman law. Uh, as codified at the end of antiquity, the most important analysis of freedom that we have in the Republican tradition. Because it begins, uh, the, the Roman law begins, as I'm sure you know, by asking de statu hominum. We, we need to know about the status, the status of men and women. And there's only two statuses you can have. You can either be free or you can be a slave. So again, the question is, well, what does it mean to be a slave? And the answer that the, raw, the Roman law gives is that you're a slave. The Latin is interesting. If you are in potestati, are you in the power of, are you subject to the will of someone else? That's slavery. So there is the Republican way of thinking about freedom. Freedom is a matter of status, and it's the status of being a free person as opposed to being a slave, and that is the status of not being subject to the arbitrary will of someone else. Now, the next thing I want to do, this lecture is in three parts, and the next part is brief, but it's a very important addendum to this philosophical analysis that I've been giving of different ways of thinking about freedom. If you look at traditions of discussion about freedom and contemporary debates, you'll see that these different traditions that I've laid out, the liberal tradition, um, the Hegelian tradition of positive liberty, the republican tradition, three completely different understandings of the concept, they're always getting muddled up. And I want to try to, to, to clarify the muddles. First of all, 
here's something that you need to understand is that there's an obvious way in which the Republican and the Liberal agree with each other as opposed to the Hegelian. Have you got these three ideas in, in mind? Okay, we've got the, all three of them. All right. So the Republican agrees with the Liberal that freedom is a negative concept. That's to say the presence of freedom is always marked by the absence of something contrary to the Hegelian who thinks that you'll have to, I'll have to watch how you act to see if you're free or not. They think it is freedom marked by an absence. The presence of freedom is marked by an absence. Where they disagree um, is what is that absence. Now where that's got confused, one confusion is that a, a lot of Republican thinking about freedom has got confused with Hegelian thinking about freedom. And if you were to take the greatest modern contemporary, the greatest contemporary historian of republicanism, um, Professor John Pocock, although his masterpiece, The Machiavellian Moment, is a masterpiece, it is systematically muddled about this point. He thinks that republicans are Hegelians. I quote him. Um, when the leading Italian defenders of the vivere libro of the high renaissance, writers like Machiavelli and Guicciardini, wrote about citizens and their libertà, they invoke the Aristotelian form of the active concept of citizenship, articulating at a high level the positive view of freedom that we are free if and only if we act in such a way as to realize our true nature. So notice he's made those Republicans into Hegelians. It's a complete mistake, I think. I, there's nothing in Machiavelli, nothing in Guicciardini that is about what it is to follow your true nature. On the contrary, it's all about whether you are in a vivere libro, whether you're a free person living in a free state, or whether you're living in servitù, whether you're living in a condition of slavery. Now, when they say if you're going to live freely, you must take part in the activities of the public realm. They do say that. The reason that they say that is not because they are Hegelians who think that if you don't, then you're not realizing your true nature. They think that you must take part because unless you can recognize your will in the law, then what you must be recognizing in the law is somebody else's will. But, if, but since you're subject to the law, under those circumstances, you are subject to somebody else's will. But that's slavery. So the reason that you must involve yourself in the business of government is that it's a causal claim about what will enable you to remain a free person. That's to say, if you can recognize your will in the law, then you are free, although you're a citizen. You're subject to the law, but you've made it yourself. So it's compatible with freedom. And that, I think, is part of the distinctive claim of the Republican. So there's the Republican and the Liberal together saying, yes, we agree freedom is negative. Uh, I mean, as I say, I'm disagreeing with Pocock there, as opposed to the Hegelian. But there's a crucial division between the Liberal and the Republican. And that is quite simply that the, the liberal thinks that you're free um, if you're not interfered with. The republican thinks two things. First of all, of course that's true. I mean, of course, if I, if I lock the door so that you can't leave the room, then you're not free to leave the room. Nobody denies that. But that's not the essence of freedom. Freedom is not about that, really. Freedom is about whether you have a status or not. Everything about actions is secondary. So you could put it in a nutshell and say the liberal thinks freedom is absence of interference on some understanding of that concept the republican thinks freedom is absence of dependence a much broader and indeed more demanding account right that's quite enough um, philosophical analysis what I want to do in the third and concluding part of this lecture um, which will be briefer than the other two parts because 55 minutes right I've so far spoken, all right, I've got um, 15 minutes left. You all right with 15 minutes? We're going to do some history. I want to end by considering three, here I go back to the great Pocock, 
what Pocock would call moments. I want to, to look at three moments in, they're going to be in uh, um, rather Western European uh, and American history in which we see the Republican theory in action. We see it as an insurgent ideology. We see it as an, uh, an ideology of liberation. The first of these three moments is at the time of the crisis of republics in 16th century Italy. You heard in the introduction Contarini celebrated De Republica Venetorum, first published in English in 1599 when they were thinking about a republic. The Queen must be dying soon, it's the sort of subtext of the translation, not of the Russian translation. But if it were translated in England now, of course, that might be this. Am I being recorded? Um, the, that's the Venetian story, but of course, yet more of a crisis is the Florentine story and the final loss of the Republic to the Medici in 1512. That loss theorized by Machiavelli in the Discorsi of 1519. There's one moment. Second great Republican moment is the successful abolition in Great Britain of the monarchy of Great Britain in 1649 and the establishment in perpetuity of a republic. It didn't last in perpetuity, but there's a second moment. And the third moment is the successful revolt of the 13 colonies in North America from the rule of the British Crown in 1776. What these moments have in common is that they're all theorized in relation to the republican theory of freedom. That's how they get legitimized. All of those moments are legitimized in terms of the theory of freedom I've laid out for you. Now, in each case, that leads to a tremendous debate where the Republican theory is vehemently attacked. So what I want to talk about is the Republican view on each of these moments, then the attack, and then the question is, did the Republicans have an answer to the attack on them? Or to put it more interestingly, as the end of the lecture, should you be a Republican, a Hegelian, or a Liberal? Okay. The Republican has two views which make for uh, the absolute distinction of the position, and you'll see now what they are. And one is a view about freedom in its character, that's to say its absence of dependence, and the second is a view about how you can maintain that freedom, which is you've got to be a lawgiver. Now, if you think of the, the first of these, what freedom means, then the same analysis is given as a legitimating account in each of these three great crises. For example, um, think of Machiavelli's Discorsi and how it analyzes the concept of freedom. If you open that great work, the first two chapters ask you what it is to live in a vivere libro, a, 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 free, a free community, or to live in servitù, to live in the manner of slaves. That's the first question he asks himself. And the answer he, he gives is that you live in servitù if you live in dependenza. If you're not independent, if you live in dependence, uh, in upon an oligarchy within your community or within a power outside it. If it's not your will, if it's the will of an oligarchy, if it's the will of a conqueror, you are in dependenza. If you're in dependenza, you're in servitude. There's the analysis. That's the beginning of the discourse. The same story is what you find if you ask, what is the view of freedom that the English Republicans have in 1649? The greatest of the English Republicans are great lyric poet John Milton, who was secretary to Oliver Cromwell and wrote the major treatises in defense of the English Republic when it was set up in 1649, has exactly the same analysis of Machiavelli for the excellent reason that he takes it from Machiavelli. Um, and in his uh, famous treatise of 1649 called the Iconoclastes, um, the, the destruction of the image, the, the image of the king, destroying the image of the king, um, what he says is that under any king, however you discuss legislation, it, I'll quote him, um, your purpose legislation will be terminated by the will of one man, a form of arbitrary power that leaves you in the miserable condition of a slave. 
So there is the same story. And finally, you get the same story again in 1776. When the American colonies set up the United States of America after their declaration in 1776, what is that declaration called? It's called the Declaration of Independence. Well, independence from what? <laughs> well, from dependence, of course. From dependenza. Why? It's the Machiavellian analysis. Dependenza is the same as servitù. And hence, in the Federalist Papers, if you ask about the analysis of freedom that makes America think of itself as the paradigm of a free state, of course, they've, they've all become liberals, they've given all of this up. But in, in 1776 and in the Federalist Papers, the account that's given is when the 13 colonies were colonies of the British Crown, they were taxed by the British Crown so that the levels of taxation were simply imposed upon them, but without any representation in the assembly that was making the taxes. So the taxes came in the form of somebody else's arbitrary will. But if you are subject to someone else's arbitrary will, you are a slave. And that's the amazing fact about the rhetoric of the American Revolution. They really knew about slavery. They were slave owners. And they were saying of themselves, we are subject to this alien power, which is imposing taxation upon us without our consent. That is slavery. And the British answer was very interesting, which was to say, look, uh, uh, trust us. Nothing bad is going to happen. But that's the word of the master. The master says, look, it'll be all right. Don't worry. But they say, I mean, that's what Tony Blair used to say to us, you know, you can trust me. Don't worry, it'll be all right. But what you say to the slave owner is, I'm not worrying about what you're doing. I'm worrying about what power you have. You've got the wrong kind of power. It's arbitrary power. Arbitrary power leaves me enslaved. And it's no use saying, yeah, but you'll be fine. Because being a slave is not fine. You don't know what's going to happen to you. That was the whole point that the American Constitution was originally about. Well, now that provoked intense debate. So there's the view of freedom. Freedom is absence of dependence. That legitimizes the need for a republic in Florence. Again, that legitimizes the, the abolition of the monarchy in Great Britain. That legitimizes the revolution of America. But of course, that was intensely debated. And the, the most interesting debates, because they're closest, I think, to us, are the ones about the American Revolution. The enemies of the American Revolution in Great Britain, especially the classical utilitarians who hated it, William Paley, Jeremy Bentham, writing bitterly against the uh, American Declaration of Independence. What do they say? They want to say, and I quote uh, Paley, you say you are rendered unfree by the mere fact of living independence upon us, even if our power is never exercised but for your benefit. But you are then saying that you are unfree in the absence of any act of interference. But if there is no interference, how is there no freedom? Well, there is the debate. So what is the Republican response to that? I mean, how is it exactly that you are unfree, even if there's no in interference at all? Well, Milton gives an immortal answer to that in his um, tenure of kings and magistrates, his great treatise of 1649, when he says, um, the life of the slave is one in which you are endlessly self-censoring yourself. You do not know what might happen to you. And so, uh, quote, um, seeing that you are wholly dependent upon the will of another, you will do everything to maintain that will as a good will, however abject or slavish your conduct as a result becomes. So we are left, and under monarchy we are always left with nothing but abject bowings and cringings, the triumph of the servile, no speaking truth to power. Why? Because you don't know what might happen. So you keep quiet. That is censorship by yourself, of yourself. You're taking away your own freedom. Don't say that you're not interfered with 
you who's doing the interfering, but you're certainly making yourselves slaves. Now, as to the point that, well, nobody actually interfered, um, well, that's a very important point for the Republican. It came out, by the way, if I make a very purely um, uh, uh, British intervention for a second, it came out with us this summer when we had a large-scale investigation of the appalling behaviour of our press, of our newspapers, when the, 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 the most villainous person, a man called Rupert Murdoch, who owns our newspapers, uh, was questioned by the High Court judge about his political power, and he said, I do not believe that any of my newspapers have ever interfered with government policy. But the point was, they didn't have to interfere. The newspapers knew that there were things they mustn't say, and the, especially the politicians knew there were things they mustn't say to the newspapers for fear of what might happen. Well, maybe nothing would happen, but maybe they would be so demoralised by the denunciations that would follow that they would lose the next election. So they didn't say. So when Rupert Murdoch said, you know, I never interfered, He's speaking as the slave owner. He doesn't have to interfere. They'll do what he wants without him having to say. And indeed, if he has to interfere, that's rather a loss of status, going to the Prime Minister and saying, you know, if I were you, I wouldn't um, make that arrangement with the European Union, because if you do, my presses will then rubbish your private life in such a way that you'll never be elected again. He doesn't have to say that. It's all understood. That's the Republican point. The second Republican point is that you are a free person if and only if you are engaged in the making of the law under which you live. If you are not so engaged, the law is not a reflection of your will but of someone else's, but in that case you are a slave. Now that second view you equally find in each of these three moments. If you look again at the beginning of Machiavelli's Discorsi, uh, now look at the beginning of Book 2. The beginning of Book 1 tells you what liberty means. The beginning of Book 2 tells you why you can be free if... Uh, how, how you can be free is if and only if you live in a self-governing republic. You can only be free in those circumstances because it's only then that the law reflects your will, in which case, as Machiavelli says, you're able to live liberamente, freely. You can live freely because you are subject to a law which you can recognise as your will. So that's um, the, the, very, the opening two chapters of Book 2. The same understanding is completely central to English republicanism of the 17th century. The most famous English writer on republicanism of that era was James Harrington in his book Oceana, 1656, which is a direct reply to Hobbes, direct reply to Hobbes's Leviathan. And in that text, um, Harrington has a, very, has a very interesting response to Hobbes. He says, um, Mr. Hobbes says um, that I am free if I am free from law. And Harrington says what he has forgotten is that I'm only free if I'm free by law. That's to say, I have to make sure that I am free by the laws that there are. But you'll only do that if you engage, help to engage, in the making of laws. And the same comes up in the American Revolution. If you think of the great defences of the American Revolution, above all Tom Paine, in his uh, treatise Common Sense of 1776, one of the major theoretical defences of the American Revolution. Um, not only attacking monarchy as an enslaving institution, but attacking mixed constitutions as well, and insisting that unless the people, at least by representation, are the sovereigns, then you are living in a state of slavery. As he says, the free person is his own legislator. So may I say, notice this second point about republicanism. The Republican thinks there's a special way of understanding freedom, and that's to say that it's absence of dependence on arbitrary will, but secondly thinks that that is intimately connected with constitutions. So the Republican thinks something much more than, for example, Maurizio Veroli says when he says that republicanism is about the rule of law. 
Sure, it is in the sense that they say only law must rule. There mustn't be extra powers, there mustn't be special executive powers, there mustn't be discretionary powers, because they're all arbitrary, so only law rules. But there's a second point that they want to make. It's not just the rule of law. You must make the law. You must be able to see either directly or by representation. If you're Rousseau, it has to be directly. Most people have supposed it has to be by representation. But you must be able to see your will in the law, otherwise you're a slave. Now, there's the second claim then. But that too was a subject of intense dispute. And the answer to that, and I, I'll give the answer that was given to the, the Americans making that claim in 1776, from the liberal stance, for example, again, Bentham. I quote Bentham, law is nothing other than the operation of coercive force. So all laws are enemies of liberty. How can liberty be made by law? Sort of attacking the Republican view. Liberty cannot be the fruit of law. Liberty and law are enemies. All law is coercion. All coercion takes away freedom. So, if you wish a maximum of liberty, you want a minimum of law. So there's the liberal attack on the um, American Declaration of Independence. And indeed, in this period, uh, um, the anti-radical uh, uh, liberal writers of the, of the Enlightenment like to mock the Republican case by saying that once you've seen that the fewer laws there are, the more liberty you have, you will see, and this is a big theme of David Hume's political essays, um, you will see that actually you're far more likely to be freer under an enlightened despotism than in a republic. Because if you live in a republic, well, you're always being called to meetings, you're always being asked to decide things, you can't get on with your own affairs, you can't get on with your life, and especially in commercial society, and this is going to be the point that Constant picks up from Hume, this is ridiculous, we can't have this way of thinking about freedom. Freedom has to be thought of in such a way that I can be free to get on with my life while somebody else gets on with the business of government. So once you understand that, as Hume says, or indeed as Constant says, that's modern liberty. And you'll see that that's the right solution. <coughs> now, what does the Republican say to that? Well, the Republican has two answers, which is to say to the Liberal, look, if that's your view of freedom, then what you're saying is that there can be no liberty as a citizen. Because no state exists without law. You can't name a state that doesn't have laws. But if all law is the enemy to liberty, then no states can guarantee any liberty to their citizens. Is that, your, is that a liberal answer? Is that what you want to say? And that was Harrington's answer to Hobbes. That is not liberalism. That is, of course in its modern form, that has become, uh, become what we now in the English language call libertarianism, a kind of anarchism, which leaves you saying, well, in that case, maybe the state is not a legal institution after all. Um, and, but do you want that? Is it possible to live outside the confines of law? Even Hobbes is there to tell you that that would be very unwise. So there is part of the answer. But a um, far more powerful answer is that what you have to realize is that if you live in a self-governing republic where take the Rousseauian case your will is actually present in the assembly that makes the law such that the law is your will it's the volonté générale and the volonté générale is the law then you are a free citizen although a subject to the law because what are you subject to you're subject to your own will but to be subject to your own will is freedom and I can only end by saying, because I've now spoken for 56 minutes, I'm sorry, that that second part of the answer, allied to the first, how should we think about freedom, and what institutions would we have to design to live as free persons? It seems to me that the Republican answer to that set of questions, which I've now tried to lay out in their response to the Liberal, gave us a critique of liberalism in the late 18th century discussion, uh, which is just as powerful now as it was when it was first articulated. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, my question is, is there a correlation between a Republican form of government and any other form of government?
forms of government, big, you know, such as uh, oligarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. And more specifically, I was wondering, any government based on the principle of representation can qualify for a self-governing republic. Mm. And what I mean is whether I am, as a citizen of the Russian Federation, can be compared to you as a citizen of, uh, of Britain, in, in the way that uh, it could be in the same status of being in the state of dependency. Mm. Because uh, here, the results of elections sometimes questions uh, in terms of their uh, unpredictability and uh, in terms of uh, transparency. While in Britain, uh, since the system is based on the elections, uh, you all the time collect the same type of people. And this is explained in Bernard Simonin's book, yeah. of Representative Dallas. Yeah. So does that mean that you living in the, well, un let's say, unquestionable uh, democratic regime, and me having doubts about my own regime, I'm in the, state, in the same state of um, freedom, because mm. we do not participate in making our own laws. Yeah. Our laws are made by someone else on whom we can yeah. only exert very limited power. Okay. Well, this is an absolutely central question. I mean, just at the theoretical level, um, w one way of distinguishing the Republican from the Liberal position would be to, um, to, to observe that Liberals are not interested in forms of government if they're interested in freedom, because they think that freedom is unconnected with forms of government. That's the point of Hume's paradox. Um, if you want to be free, that's to say minimally interfered with, you might do better under an oligarch, you might do better under an absolute monarch than you would under a republic. Uh, so the way in which the republican connects forms of government to freedom is by challenging the underlying understanding of freedom. Okay, so the republican says, no, this really does matter because that's the wrong way to think about freedom. Freedom has to be seen as um, intimately connected with self-government, not only in the government of the self, but in the government of the polity. So the, the key figure here, reviving this classical story for the Enlightenment, is Rousseau. Now, the question then arises, and I mention Rousseau because he gives such a strong answer to this question. All right, you say that I'm only free if I'm in effect a legislator, I must be able to see my will in the law. How can that be institutionalized? And Rousseau is the great enemy of the idea of the represented will. He, he says, well, it can only, that's why he says he's so proud to be a citizen of Geneva. It can probably only be effectively operational in a very small scale city republic where you can genuinely see a relationship of your will to the volonté générale and will that will in such a way that that becomes the law. Um, so Rousseau is disgusted with the modern territorial states of, of Europe, of course, um, because they don't have the institutions that would uphold your standing as, freedom, as free people. Now, the, 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 the more particular question you raise is where does that leave us? Well, of course, if, if you're a Rousseauvian, it leaves us as slaves, of course because the represented will is not your will. What we have done in modern democracies, uh, we call them democracies, but they're not democracies if you're a Rousseauvian at all. Because a democracy, if you think of the etymology of that term, is ruled by the people, the demos. But the demos does not rule in Great Britain any more than the demos rules in the Russian Federation or any, anywhere. A political class rules, and we elect it to represent, well, to represent the public good. That's the idea. Um, so, if you're not a Rousseauvian, what you want is a very strong analysis of the concept of representation and how that would have to operate for us to feel that we were not dependent. If you ask me about the British case, I would say we're doing very badly and worse and worse 
We're doing badly because it's still a monarchy and there are huge reserves called the royal prerogative. They are not operated any longer uh, by the crown as a corporation, but they're operated by the chief executive for the time being, acting in the name of the crown as a corporation. The British Constitution has three corporations. Um, the crown that represents itself, the lords who represent themselves, and the commons who are represented. So it's a mixed constitution and it's all representation except two of the corporations represent themselves. Now the one crown, the crown corporation, has handed um, prerogative powers to the executive. But that means that the British executive has incredibly strong prerogative powers, including for example the right to declare war and peace, which is not a democratic power, it's a power of the head executive, and it took Britain into the Iraq war without any vote of parliament because it was the decision of the prime minister. That's legal but that's a very undemocratic constitution. Furthermore, um, fears about terrorism have uh, caused our executive to take on very extensive um, uh, discretionary powers, um, none of which are in statute, um, none of which have a democratic mandate. So the condition of a citizen of a country which is moving in that direction with an increasingly strong executive and uh, um, a legislative assembly which isn't even all elected. We are the one member of the European Union with a non-elected legislative assembly. I mean, it's a contradiction in the 21st century. So, um, yeah, we're slaves. <laughs> <laughs> so, more questions as well for those. Thank you very much. Great lections for the presence to see you. Well, especially from those who are not from St. Petersburg in Moscow, who okay, came from you know different parts of Russia. I would like to ask just uh, ask you just to clarify some some points about this concept of freedom. You said that the American freedom doesn't have anything in common with actions. It's about the states. Yeah. And you also said that it derives from Libby and Gaspis, the Roman historians who were that influential for those three moments, Italy, England and the US. Uh, I wonder about how can we locate this Republican tradition in history? Mm. Should it be located around this, say, Florentine Anglo Saxon kind of paradigm? Then Tacitus and Titus Filius are not Republican themselves. Good. Or, yeah. or, or mm. well, uh, are they? Why am I asking? There's strong, you know, practical, practical things about it. Uh, if this kind of agenda is that strongly connected to Anglo form of thought, then we must say that in Russia there were no public tradition before the Accord. Mm. Because Harlington and Machiavelli and you know, uh, Jefferson were not that influential. Yeah, yeah. If we say that Tacitus and it really also count, then uh, also. Yeah. This is, this is very important, and I've given, um, as I was saying in my talk, a Western European story here, or partly. In, Partly, uh, I mean, it's a sort of French, Italian, American, British story. Um, uh, that's indefensible, except for very, one very important point, which is that lecturers ought only to talk about what they know about. I mean, and many years of giving lectures have finally persuaded me to talk only about what I think I know about. So that helps to explain it. If I was going to talk about the, 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 the historical story here, I would want to stress far more than I succeeded in doing in the lecture. Um, the importance not of the, I mean, it's a Roman story, but not of, of the Roman historians, but Roman law. Roman law becomes the law of every Western European country. Uh, and the, em the emergence of common law as a rival to Roman law is a very specific feature of uh, British and American experience. If you think of the law of the European Union, it's fundamentally Roman law. So that document it, and its fortunes in the history of the European polities would be where we should take our starting point from. We should take our vocabulary from there. I mean, the, the whole Roman law vocabulary about the law of persons, what it is to be a free person, what it means to be a slave, what uh, arbitrary power means, all of this is worked out in the Roman law of persons, which is essentially, as you know, um, a theory of private law. It's a theory of persons and property. It isn't a theory of public law. Uh, and all of that gets applied from Roman law into public law. So if we were talking about um, writing a serious history of republicanism, then it would have to 
take seriously that it's a Roman story and the fortunes of Roman law in the polities of Europe would be the thing to focus on. Actually, it turns out there's a lot to be said, especially about Eastern Europe as well, in relation to the Roman law case. Um, could I just correct something where I obviously didn't speak as clearly as I should have done? I think that it's true, as you say, that a distinction between the mainstream way of thinking about freedom in political theory and the Republican way should be stated to begin with, to make it clear that there's a huge distinction. One talks about actions and interference with actions. One talks about status of a free person. But the status of a person who is not free is the status of someone whose actions are under the control of another. So you can bring the two traditions completely together, but you can also make them collide by saying that, if you like definitions, the liberal view is that freedom is absence of interference, the uh, Republican view is that freedom is absence of relations of domination and dependence. So it's, it's a relationship, it's a status point, but actions are involved because um, an action that is the product of your will being dominated by someone is not a free action. <coughs> I have uh, kind of two minor questions you, about yeah. you know, your conceptual mapping. Um, well, the first one concerns Locke. In, in Locke, it seems to be that in some very deep sense of the world, uh, human beings are always free. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, the will of human beings are not encouraged as, you know, I, 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 I would like just to refer to his uh, first words are concerned with racial, yes. you know, this yeah, yeah. famous, uh, famous argument about irrationality of uh, intolerance, you mm. not coerce my will, so mm. the will is free, you know, uh, mm. whatever, whatever the actions mm. of another agent are. Yeah. And of course, Jonas Prost, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, discussion with Locke, was, to, was one who highlighted the importance of coercion of the view uh, when he defended kind of a rationality of mild persecution, of mild coercion of the view. Mm. So I wonder how does it yeah, very this good. story fit yeah. to, you know, uh, to your map? The second one, uh, I think, somehow relates to this, but is very different. Uh, this is a story of Romans. You know, in the Roman thought, of course, there was, um, there was at least one very uh, strong trend of thought which thought that slaves are free yeah. persons. I mean, Stoics, Epictetus, oh, yeah. Seneca, mm -hmm. you know, and all these guys. And of course, this story was inherited by, well, partly inherited, partly, um, you know, reworked by um, early Christianity. And uh, I would also mention St. Augustine, for example, with his, with his famous understanding of freedom yeah. as something which does not have anything to do with the state. Yeah. You know, the freedom is rather yeah, yeah. the capacity to conserve the true view if God uh, yeah. gives it to you. Yeah. So, in a sense, all human beings are free even if they are enslaved by the sin, if they uh, non also from the Kai. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, in order to be Republican, in a sense, it doesn't require you know, to consider human being as kind of zone where it's born in the Aristotelian sense of the world, you know, of the world. so you cannot be, not only you cannot be free out of the, or out of the polity, but uh, you also, for, to be human being, you have to participate in the polity, and this is, you know, very different, uh, very different understanding of humanity, yeah. you know, yes. uh, from, uh, from what Augustine thought. Yes. So how does this fit uh, to your mind? Well, uh, th those are wonderful observations. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I will produce a, a, a little map to answer the question, but the first thing to say, is this is very important, is that this lecture has been about 
how to understand the notion of civil liberty. I was quite careful to say that. We're talking here about civil liberty, the political liberty of the individual, freedom in relation to the law. We're talking about freedom in civil associations. Now, you're absolutely right, um, and I must say a word about this, that this is very far from exhausting what we want to say when we want to talk about freedom. And I would want to say, um, pushing the map a little bit, Is that okay? No. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll keep doing this. This is a bit like a pop singer. Um, okay. In addition to civil freedom, we need two, at least, other ways of thinking about freedom, which are absolutely crucial. And I'll call them metaphysical freedom and um, freedom of mind. Metaphysical freedom is the view that when I say I can do this or I can do that. That is not an illusion. Okay? Now, um, Hobbes, for example, think, well, that, is, that really is an illusion. Uh, determinism is the truth about human nature. There's, no, there's always a causal account which would make it determined that you did that and not that. But the metaphysics of freedom for Locke is that that intuition, that I can do this, I can do that, and that's a choice, and that's free. That's what I'm calling metaphysical freedom. That's absolutely right. That's crucial to not, absolutely crucial. In fact, it's applied to Hobbes. Um, but it's not what I've been talking about this evening. Uh, closer to what I've been talking about, some very interesting observations you make here in late antiquity, especially, is freedom of mind. You might think that what matters about freedom is not civil liberty, but freedom of mind. Now, the great text which um, insists on that point, uh, Augustine, of course, makes the point, but I think you agree with you that Boethius is really the most important text for us to think about in this context, the, con the so-called De Consolatio and Philosophia, the Consolation of Philosophy. Um, philosophy is personified in that great text as a woman who appears to Boethius, the Lady Philosophy, and she offers him consolation. Now, Boethius is, at the time, um, in prison on the sentence of death, uh, which was carried out. And the lady philosophy appears to him and says, look, I don't know what you're worried about, you're free. And he thinks, well, what do you mean I'm free? I'm in prison. And she says, yes, but that's because you're thinking about freedom wrongly. You think that freedom is being out of, being, being out of, being out of prison, and if you can't get out of prison, you're free. You're thinking about freedom all wrongly. Freedom is freedom of thought. Your thoughts remain free. The emperor has put you in prison, you can't imprison your thoughts. And philosophy, the lady of philosophy, urges him to see that the only freedom that matters is that he can think his own thoughts. And Louisius, a complete idiot, obviously, thinks, well, oh, that's great, so I'm free after all. And that's the book. <laughs> and he tells us about his freedom. And that's what I'm calling freedom of mind. Freedom of mind is extremely important, and it's very important in Locke as well. Because um, whatever the state can do in relation to, to religion, it has to recognize that many of my religious beliefs are inside my head, and it can't do anything about that. That is the source of what I'm thinking about toleration. So that is another very important way of thinking about freedom. But again, that's not civil liberty. And of course, that's the harsh truth that Boethius is asked to recognize. Civil liberty doesn't matter. What matters is freedom of mind. Yeah, uh, these are wonderful questions. Don't stop. <laughs> well, when people are thinking, I can ask mine. I mean. <clears throat> Quentin, I mean, the one thing which you just stressed, I think it's very important, is the uh, contrast between civil liberty and freedom of thought, or civil liberty and liberty, let's say, I don't know, in personal life, because the problem with civil association is that the feminists have decisively put into question the borders of where polities end, where they begin. Sure. And uh, at least uh, uh, my mentor, when I was doing my PhD, wrote a book which, which I don't agree, but that's a book by Hannah Pitkin on uh, Machiavelli, yeah. where she says that the whole notion of dependence is mm -hmm. developed through his hatred of women. Yeah. And well, this is of course an arguable thesis, uh, but the point here is pretty much straightforward in a sense. <clears throat> 
It's the first time I hear you to use the notion of dependence and of course stressing the links to the Declaration of Independence in America mm -hmm. because usually the Republican like you would say that the notion is not to be under somebody else's will. Mm -hmm. It's the first time when I hear the notion of dependence or dependence in central. And why do I think that this changes an argument? Well, <clears throat> first, of course, is the argument that um, Machiavelli's notion of getting free, uh, a feminist analysis might read into him the idea of being free from the matron uh, who controls access to a lady. I mean, that's the point. And then, of course, the famous metaphor of beating the fortune, right, as a woman into shape. And this is what makes for proto-fascist uh, overtones in Machiavelli's analysis. Now, this is an overstatement that might be, but another thing which, of course, where the position of Machiavelli is developed to the fullest is, of course, Kant and the statement of the need of autonomy, the personal autonomy, right? You do not have to be dependent on somebody else, mm -hmm. and that's when you become mature and a full uh, individual, capable of freedom. Now, one of the former Republicans who became right now uh, an interesting philosopher, but in different guise, uh, uh, Alasdair McIntyre, uh, at some point, his last book was called, if I'm not uh, mistaken, Rational Dependent, Dependent Animals. Yes. By claiming that Kant and maybe Machiavelli with him have invented this fiction that in order to be a human being, you have to be independent. Uh, and that is the dream of a small boy who wants to liberate himself from the mother and from the, all the vicissitudes of relationship with the second sex. And that's why Kant uh, kind of was in favor of that, and uh, Machiavelli might have been in the same situation. Well, in fact, most of our lives, you and I and others spend our lives as dependents, as kids or as elderly people. So when McIntyre moved into old age, he actually wrote that Kant is wrong. Dependence is the rule. Most of the time we depend on others. That's what ladies know better than, okay. than men. <laughs> So then the ideal of uh, independence is seriously questioned in terms, in terms of uh, claiming that this is a good thing in one's personal fate. I mean, it's a male standard imposed on the rest of the humankind. It's supported by old white males like Machiavelli and Kant, but it's not really... I mean, this is, I'm just repeating the usual radical critique of where, what's no. going on here. Yeah. And in a sense, how can we affirm that standard and that ideal at the level of civil liberty if it was seriously questioned in interpersonal relations? Okay, um, well, there are two parts, one to this critique, one of which is sort of concessive and the other is, is not. Um, I certainly want to distress, to, 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 to emphasize dependence. I always wanted to do that. My formulations of Republican theory of freedom have always related it to dependence rather than to questions about domination, as Philip Pettit has preferred to put it. They may come out to the same thing. But my texts all talk about dependence, dependence, independence, independence. Um, now, I don't want to think to stress that for, um, for, for sexist reasons. On the contrary, it's a way of saying that the personal is the political, and we, we all agree that the personal is the political, and that the redrawing of those boundaries has been very important in recent um, civil philosophy, but they were not unknown to earlier Republicans, uh, of whom I suppose Mary Wollstonecraft is the earliest Declaration of the Rights of Man comes out. Of, uh, so in 1792, she published Declaration of the Rights of Women. This is an analysis of the dependence of women on men, especially economically, but making the point which is central to any Republican analysis, which is that if you're in a condition of dependence, you will mold yourself in a certain way, as women mold themselves upon what they think men want of them, and that that is their condition of bondage. John Stuart Mill changed his mind about freedom, which is far too little said about him, from 1859, the essay on liberty, to 1869, his final important text called The Subjection of Women. Notice he's now contrasting freedom not with interference, but with subjection. What is the subjection of women? It's a subjection to men. First of all, it is indeed the political, but I mean, it's childish in that guitar, and of, of people who, who want to attack this particular view of autonomy, which is not a counting view of autonomy, um, to, to try to make it genuine. It, it is a view which is not really hospitable to, but which absolutely incorporates um, the insights of feminists in a way that liberalism has found it much harder to do. Second point, this is the concessive point. 
the image of depend independence as being the value that we're after, that is it as, as a childish fantasy, that would be right. But the reason that that's not an interesting criticism is, uh, and this is so important to say this, but does it have to be said except to these idiots? Um, freedom is not the only value. And it's an important value in our lives, but other values are obviously justice, solidarity, charity, compassion, honesty, decency. I mean, the list is huge. Who would want to think that the image of freedom and the valorizing of freedom suggests that dependence is always to be avoided as the only either? You might, um, well, here's possibility. You might fall desperately in love. There's something that all these writers think about, oh my God, slave to the passions. You know, you're not a free person any longer. So the answer might be, well, who cares? I don't know, I don't think you know, you're missing it off. That might be the answer. And that would be a very good answer. Freedom is one value, but these values collide and contest with each other, and the life of the grown-up person is trying to get them into some sort of story to tell. Not supposing that when you valorize one of them, you're not valorizing others. Yeah. by contrast with the liberal in talking about freedom, that the liberal view of freedom as we now have it, especially as promulgated uh, from the United States of America, which has such an enormous and in some ways disastrous influence upon the rest of the world, is to say that the, more, the less law you have, the more freedom you have. They think that's sort of obvious. So they're enemies of the state. And that it has a libertarian wing, which is almost anarchistic, which thinks, well, we should probably stop taxing people. You know, it's our money. Uh, I mean, that, that incapacity to think about the state, which is a recurrent feature of modern uh, um, American thinking. Um, so what the Republican would want to say to that sort of a person might be important not just in America, but also in Russia, it's certainly important in the United Kingdom, is that the, the Republican is the person who thinks that that whole liberal discussion has gone off the rails because it's got the wrong way of thinking about freedom. It thinks the more freedom, the less law. The Republican thinks, not necessarily at all, there could be more freedom with more law. It depends who's making the law. It, it, so, whereas the Liberal thinks, the more law, the less freedom, the Republican thinks, who's making this law? And so I urge you to ask that question of the Russian case. And the more that the answer seems to you, not me, and not even my representative will, then that's a problem. But you see, if you take the liberal case, neither of those are problems. I mean, you know, who needs it? So if, if you're attracted to the way of thinking about freedom that I've eventually foregrounded this evening, what that means is you've got to think more seriously about the institutions that make a democracy. Notice that the Republican theory of freedom should really be called the democratic theory of freedom, because it is a theory of equal freedom of each of us from conditions of dependence upon the arbitrary will of others. It, it thinks that the, the value is to try to limit arbitrariness in our society. Which, of course, is also Locke's view. Um, so it's, it's, it's um, a view not unaccommodated to that kind of liberalism. It just means that Locke is not a liberal. Um, so that's the way I would urge you to think about it. Think of it in democratic terms and ask yourself what institutions you need and what you need to abolish. Answering the question over here, I was saying that in the, in the British case, it's very obvious what we have to abolish. We have to abolish the, the House of Lords. We have to make that an elected chamber. We have to abolish the monarchy uh, with the royal prerogative. 
um, we have to have more frequent elections because uh, a slow turnover gives rise to greater corruption, um, and so on. It's sort of obvious what has to be done if we're serious about democracy. But now, I mean, everyone... Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> Reported newspapers as Russians have called to abolition. <laughs> <laughs> Russian assembly. Okay. Uh, we have. Okay. There's a question over there, please. Um, okay. Actually, uh, it seems to me that this question you might uh, discover a bit kind of problematic, kind of this philosophy of And it's based in case, maybe it may sound ironic, but nevertheless. Okay. There is this, this thing that uh, smoking is restricted in most countries of the European Union, in public spaces. Uh, it, it seems to me that in this case, the uh, presence of a person in public spaces makes him just dependent on, on common law, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, the question is here, uh, how do Republicans, uh, how does the Republican tradition view public spaces yeah. and some kind of making of some I don't know, conference about them. That is the question. Very good question. Um, Republican tradition is structured in the political theory is not good for asking these questions. And that's a very important point to make. The Republicans are trying to reach for um, a very obvious principle that is in common with liberal political philosophy, which is of course, unnecessary interference with people's civil rights is in the front community. The, the, the Republican, there's nothing in the Republican case that would want them to deny that. So if you now lock the door and you say no one is free to leave, you know, the Galeans, we can all agree that you know, our right to leave has been interfered with. That's not a dispute. Okay. The Republican wants to say, yeah, but that's not what, that's not really what, that's not, that's not the most important thing at all, talking about freedom. The Liberal wants to say, it certainly is the most important thing. So there's one way of making the debate. The Republican in these cases tends to take the Liberal view, which is to say, there will have to be a very strong argument for the public good that would require us to, to accept the obvious restriction on someone's freedom of action and maybe on their civil rights are preventing them smoking in public places. And my own private information, especially in the United States, is to think that the attack on smoking is, is kind of form of it, it's, um, it's persecution and it's sort of paranoid. I mean, you could sit in an open air restaurant in the United States just next to a road where the fumes are enormous, and I'll be fair about five inches in one nose, which are going to be enormously more dangerous to your health than any number of smokers to be next to you. But one is forbidden and the other is encouraged. But they've got it the wrong way around. Those are not Republican reflections, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the important thing about the, the Republican is not that they that it's not that they disagree with the liberal about the rights. The Republicans quite have to talk about the rights. It's just that they don't think that's the important part. Please, that's going to be the last question. Thank you very much for your um, brilliant and impressive uh, lecture. Um, I wonder, if, uh, is it possible um, to um, um, determine uh, the uh, Republican rights of freedom of, of uh, liberty, not, uh, not mentioning uh, positive points uh, introduced by the Einstein government? Mm. Yes. Uh, 
It's just that the Greek, and this is what the needs of genealogy and morality is all about, isn't it? Is that the Greek idea that indeed freedom is, is service, is service to, to the public good, uh, is replaced by the Christian idea that freedom is service, but it's service to some um, other good. Uh, and so there's a time for the same morality in the Greek, of course, he's playing with this idea of freedom and slavery, that Christian freedom is slavery. If you're, a, if you're a real classicist of that nature. Um, but what's interesting, surely, to us is that the classical story and the Christian story are two attempts to make sense of liberty as having a positive content because they both think that freedom is a paradox because that true freedom is, in some sense, a life of service. Freedom is a life of service. Um, now, underpinning that, in both cases, is a strongly normative understanding of human nature. That the first thing that a Christian will say to you is you have to understand that you are under a burden of sin and that there has to be emancipation from that sin. And the Christian story is a story about how to, how to do that. It all depends upon another world. That's what the story of Nietzsche and Christianity says. And that's kind of horrible story. That's ridiculous. And what we want is a different story about service. Now, what, where I think the power of secularized liberalism in our cultures has been wholly benign is to say to both those stories, look, we do not think that there is a normative ideal of human nature that we can describe in one of these ways. We just don't think that. I mean, we all have different passions, we all have different natures. And the idea of regularizing them into some story that enables me to say, you're not really living the life of a free man, that is horrible. And uh, there's nothing in republicanism, I say against Hocock and people, there's nothing in republicanism that would lead the republican not to be completely, I mean, republicanism is a form of liberalism. It's just a form of liberalism that takes democracy more, serious, more seriously than the republicans do. It has nothing to do with these insurgent views about how, which are again so prominent in our society, that unless you are a certain sort of a person, you're not really a good sort of a person. You're not a free sort of a person. Yeah. Actually, the audience is pointing to me that they are ready to go with more questions. I mean, are you? Tell me. Uh, well, I mean, people will want something to drink, won't they? I mean, <laughs> I think. I'm all in favour of liberating people, but on the other hand, their real interest is in hearing this one more question. Okay, well, why don't we go for another question, because I have to liberate the, rule, uh, the room at 8 o'clock. This is the only arbitrary rule I have to impose in the way. Okay, now that's a law. That's not arbitrary at all. You're the boss. <laughs> okay, please. Thank you for your talk here, and this is Dr. Blake, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, 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 clear up uh, what, what, what is to participate in making law? Mm. Because uh, I've understood that it's not only about making new laws, but keeping the law in force, yeah. like, like defending the law and by law also the other, uh, other citizens and yes. also. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how is this connected, like yeah. depending on the law and making the law? And one more thing to add is what it uh, like demands from the citizens to be able to make law or the defend law. Very good. The traditional Republican story, with a few notable exceptions, has not been strong in answering your question. It goes back to what I was saying to an earlier question that um, a way to carry forward this project in in political thinking and in political policy making would be um, not to do what I've done this evening, which is to provide this kind of map, but to say, okay, well, I see where I am on this map, but the question is your question, which is, well, all right, we're saying that the free person is the legislator, but how do we make that operational in our societies? Now, Republicanism has not been good at answering that question. The best sorts of answers are given, I think, by legal philosophers who have been very insistent on recalibrating the balance between executives, judiciaries, and legislatives. In traditional mixed governments, which is how most modern democracies operate, there's an independent judiciary, there's also a legislative 
and that they're rejected. Now what's happened um, is that judiciary has run out of control to some degree. I mean, if you think of the American Constitution, you think of it in terms of the traditional theory of sovereignty, you'd have to say that the Supreme Court is sovereign because it makes law that nobody can make law for it. And its law is the final word. You know, it can determine the election, just as it did, of course, in 1924. Um, so that would be a very un-Republican part. The Republican would say, well, I didn't elect these people. Uh, we don't have Supreme Court in Britain. We don't elect these people. This is just um, a, a group of lawyers who are appointed. You'd have to have tremendous faith in the independence of law from ideology. But we're all Marxists enough to think that it's absurd to have that faith. So that would be one worry. Another worry would be the extraordinary extent of discretionary power that in all democracies the um, executive has been taking over the legislature. I mean, look at what's just happened um, in Egypt. The president says, you know, I've got all these judges, they're running things, but they're in part of the regime, so I'm firing the judges and I'm taking all power. Now, that's exactly, of course, and so everyone is back on the streets. The instinct there, which seems to be an actually good instinct, is to say, just we don't want to be run by lawyers, we don't want to be run by executives, we want to be run by us. That's what everyone in Egypt is saying, this week, can't they? This is meant to be for us, uh, not our free power. Now, the question is how you make it us. Uh, and honestly, if I knew the answer to that question, um, Wow, that was something. <laughs> uh, and there's the Rousseauian answer, which says, well, don't put up the representation. And it's very difficult to see how to make that operation, except by doing something that all current governments of democracies hate, which is enormously to increase the power of local government. That's one way of doing it, so that people can identify with it, and then it can relate to central government. You've got an extremely complex federation. Um, that would, be, um, a, that would be a kind of American story. Not that they do that, but that would be the traditional American story. Um, or you can say, um, which is the way that it's done in, in any of the modern democracies, best of all done in Australia, which is to say, well, we need bicameralism, but everyone has to be elected, of course, and they have to be elected very frequently indeed, because the, so that they have two plus as the maximum length of any lawful assembly. And why is that? Well, for reasons that Matthew Rennie clarified. The longer they're there, the more corrupt they become, the more they serve their own interests, the more they become a political class. Keep them moving. That's, that's the thought. So some thoughts along those lines would be important. By the way, um, Philip Pettit, who is the most important philosopher of Republicanism in the United States, certainly in the English language, has just published a book, and it was published uh, on Monday, uh, called On the Legal Terms which is an attempt to take seriously the sort of things I've been saying this evening and say, all right, suppose we agree with all of that, what institutions are we committing ourselves to? And I think that is the question that we're going to I guess that's the question which will be left open for the conference. Let me just say okay. words. And Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Wonderful question, really. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.